All right, we are good to go. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to start off by talking about the social media uh, professional development uh, bonus points uh, program that uh, I've introduced uh, this semester for this class. So this is going to be a opportunity to do two things. Number one, develop your uh, professional social media presence, uh, and we'll see why that's becoming more and more important in today's uh, workplace, in today's uh, graduate school uh, environment. And then we're also um, going to uh, do this program for bonus points in this course uh, itself. So as mentioned uh, in the syllabus, um, the more of this that you complete, uh, the more uh, percent uh, you'll be able to drop off of your lowest scoring uh, assignments, exams, uh, pre-test, post-test, wherever it might come from, you'll be able to drop more and more of your lowest score, so it'll help your uh, grade in this course as well. So uh, we mentioned that uh, this is becoming more and more important uh, in today's world to have this professional presence on social media. So the question you might be asking is, why? Why is it becoming more important? Well, uh, in a recent uh, survey of employers, uh, people that are employing, for example, psychology students, uh, what they found was that 70% of employers these days will take a look at your social media profile. So the vast majority will actually take a look to see, are you online, and more specifically, what are you doing online? So what is it that they're looking for? Well, 61% said they're, they're looking for information that supports your qualifications. So if you mention that you do have statistical skills after this course, if you mention that you are proficient in Excel, they're gonna look for stuff on your profile that indicates that you will be proficient in Excel. If, they, if you mention that you are, you know, you've always been interested in psychology, they're going to look for things on your social media profile, psychology related, to see if uh, your profile supports your qualifications. 50% uh, say that they look for a professional online persona. So they want to make sure that you have a professional presence. If you're trying to be a psychologist, they want to make sure that you have a presence that is dedicated to psychology on this uh, network. 37% uh, will take a look at what other people are posting about you. So how are you interacting with others? What kind of comments are they making on your particular posts? And then this last one, 20% uh, are looking for any reason not to hire you. So they are looking for any reason to disqualify you from the process of getting you hired. So while a presence on social media can be a huge positive, as, we, as we've just seen, if you do it incorrectly, if you develop it incorrectly, or if you have the incorrect uh, content on there, it can also be a very dangerous negative. So the bottom line is that in today's market, you do need a professional social media presence, but you got to make sure that it's tailored in a way to be most beneficial for you as, in this case, a student. Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing in this social media professional development. So other reasons that you uh, might want to get engaged with this, this is a great way to connect with the community to build your uh, community. So you will be able to interact with uh, fellow students here at IUSB, and even more importantly, elsewhere. So there are a lot of uh, social media hubs for students in your position. If you go to grad school for students in grad school where you can get tips and advice and uh, interact with that community. And it'll also help you plug you into uh, your uh, area of interest. So specifically, it'll connect you to other psychologists. Uh, most importantly, it'll connect you to psychologists at grad schools that you might be interested in going to. Or it could connect you to psychologists at institutions that you might be interested in working for. But it'll get you plugged into that uh, community. So to achieve these goals, we're going to start, we're going to have a multi-step uh, program throughout the semester and uh, we're going to start it off uh, rather uh, straightforwardly and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have everybody sign up for a professional social media account and what we're going to do is we're going to do Twitter. So the reason that we've chosen Twitter is when I was researching this, uh, this program, I was taking a look at what social media uh, platforms do employers look at. And then I was looking at what social media platforms do graduate schools look at. 
And the only social media platform, or sorry, the highest on both of those lists was Twitter. So for employers, LinkedIn, I think is actually ranked uh, number one. I forget what it is for uh, grad schools, but definitely Twitter was the only one that was in the top five for both. So that one is gonna be where we're gonna get our maximum benefit. So sign up for a professional Twitter account. These lecture notes uh, or slides are in uh, Canvas under the social media development um, uh, folder in files. So you can sign up by clicking on that link right there. And uh, that is when you're first signing up with Twitter. And then if you do have a Twitter account already, I would highly recommend that unless it's a strictly professional account, sign up for a secondary account. So for example, I have a personal Twitter account where I will post, I don't use it too much anymore, but I would post videos of my daughter competing at different swim meets. But then I have a professional Twitter account where I post everything psychology related. And it's important for your account to have a unifying theme. So make sure that if you have already, if you already have an account and it was more personal uh, of an account, make sure that you sign up for a new one that's gonna be your professional account. So once you sign up for your account uh, to complete the uh, assignment uh, for the first part of it, you wanna send me a screenshot of your Twitter username and you're gonna submit that via Canvas Assignments. So there is a tab now in Canvas Assignments where you can upload your screenshot. And what we're looking for is basically something like this. So this is from uh, my account. So it'll have your name on it and then it'll have your username. So my username is that polite and saying. So the screenshot that has that information, submit that for part one of this uh, assignment. And then the second part as sort of your first connection in uh, this network, uh, you're gonna wanna follow my account. So follow at Polite Insane on Twitter and uh, send me a screenshot of your following list. And once again, you're gonna upload that via Canvas assignments. So if you go to your homepage and you can reach this part, if you're, on, uh, if you're doing this on uh, PC, you can reach it by clicking here on profile. If you're doing it via Android or other ones, uh, basically you'll access your profile in slightly different ways. We should be able to find it. If not, uh, just Google how to locate it. But if you're looking for your profile, that'll get you to your username here. And then once you have that, you can click on uh, who you're following, and that'll give you a list of who you're following. And this is a screenshot that you're gonna send, and you wanna make sure that you have, that you scroll to the part where it lists that you are following me. And uh, that's part two of this. Uh, assignment number one. So sign up for a, for a professional Twitter account, take a screenshot of that, upload it to Canvas, follow me, go to your following page, take a screenshot of that, upload it to Canvas. And again, we're doing this because it's growing more and more important. So 70% of employers will look at your social media profile. This is from an article that's a few years old. I'm sure it has grown since that time. So it's important to make sure that we're developing a presence it's important to make sure that we're connected to other students that are like you. And it's also important that you get connected to other psychologists so that you can benefit from uh, their content and also so you can get on their radar uh, so that when your application crosses their desk, they'll recognize you because of the interactions in that community. And again, we're gonna build that throughout the semester. All right, so the due date for that, we're gonna just, you know, we're gonna keep this very simple and very easy going. This is for bonus points. The due date for that is Monday, January 27th uh, by midnight, upload it to Canvas. And again, this is for bonus points. This is completely optional. Uh, it would be very beneficial for you to get involved. I understand if uh, you might not uh, choose to take advantage of this, but for those of you that do, uh, if you would like to earn uh, the bonus points for it, just make sure that you uh, upload those two screenshots by the deadline. And it needs to be screenshots. Um, it needs to be uploaded in a image format. And there are links in the assignment if you are unsure of how to do that with your, uh, with whatever technology you're using, there are links in the assignment on how to do that. Any questions on social media professional development assignment number one? All right, and if you have, uh, some of you I, I, I know are from, uh, classes where I've done this before. If you've already, you know, have your account, if you've already uh, followed me previously, just go to that page, uh, take your screenshots, 
uh, upload that and uh, you'll get points uh, for participating. All right, so that was social media professional development. And now we're gonna turn to today's class. All right, so now we're gonna do, uh, turn to today's class. What we're gonna do now is we're going to start with, um, or we're gonna continue on with statistical tools. Uh, tools that we're gonna use throughout this semester. So this is a big one today, uh, displaying um, scores uh, or groups of numbers using tables and graphs. Uh, this is something that we're gonna use throughout the entire uh, semester. So these are some fundamental skills that we wanna make sure that we develop. So uh, what we're gonna look at today is we're gonna introduce the idea of descriptive versus uh, inferential statistics, so the two major branches of statistics. We're gonna take a look at frequency distributions, a very important tool to help our human minds understand numbers. Uh, we're gonna learn how to construct and read a frequency table, and then we're gonna learn how to read uh, histograms. And then I'll just mention a little bit about homework assignment uh, number two, uh, the homework for chapter one. All right, so this is all part of that building our foundations uh, of skills. What we're doing today is not gonna seem too statistic-y, I guess if that's a word, but we are doing this in preparation and building our skills for the super cool stuff that we're gonna be doing in the latter half of this semester. But just a reminder that it all builds on the skills that you are developing right now. And the more practice you put in now, the more straightforward the rest of this semester is gonna be. So be sure that you are taking advantage of all the opportunities for practice, the study plan, the extra Excel sheets, uh, the pre-test, post-test homework, all of those. Make sure that you are getting very automatic with these skills because again, the more automatic it is now, the easier it's gonna be to chain it all together to do the amazing things that stats can do, but it builds upon that automatic foundation. All right, so let's say, let's just set this up. Let's say, uh, with a hypothetical, let's say that you were interested in sports psychology. And uh, this is actually one of the largest growing fields of psychology right now. And you wanted to know, what is the effect of participating in sports? What are the psychological effects of actually getting out there, uh, getting exercise, and uh, participating in an organized sport? And there is, again, evidence that, and this is from the APA, that this is one of the largest areas of demand uh, in the future for psychology is actually in sports psychology. So let's say that you want to ask that question. What does participating in an organized sport do for you psychologically? What you're going to need at the beginning stages of this project is you're going to need to use descriptive statistics. And descriptive statistics, these are statistics uh, statistical skills, statistical procedures that you use in order to organize data, in order to summarize data, basically in order to take massive amounts of scores and boil them down to something that our human brains can understand. It's to take all of these scores that we have and reduce them to a format that makes sense to our human brains. We need to simplify this data somehow. So for example, if you were doing this project, let's say that you wanted to know the influence of exercise and participating in organized sports on self-esteem. Let's say that that was your question. What you would do is you would start asking people who participated in organized sports, like this child over here, you would ask them, how much do you participate in organized sports? And you would give them a test on depression. So you would do that for this player over here, and you would do that for this college player over here, and you would do it for this high school girl over here, and you would do it for this guy over here who's waiting on the sidelines in a, uh, in a house league. Uh, you would do it for subject after subject after subject after subject after subject. At some point, you might end up with something like 200 scores. You've interviewed 100 subjects, you got 100 scores on how much do they uh, play in organized sports, you got 100 scores for depression. Those 100 scores to your human mind are not gonna make any sense. There's just too much data to, to understand. So descriptive statistics is gonna simplify that, and oftentimes it simplifies it by replacing all of these scores with often a single number. So we're gonna see very early on 
how we use one, for example, representative number to stand in for an entire set of data. So that is the descriptive statistics side of things where you summarize data into a format that your human brain, your human mind can understand. The other side of statistics, which we're gonna do in the second half of this course, is inferential statistics. And inferential statistics is where the power of psychology comes from. It's where the ability of psychology to help people uh, comes from. Because inferential statistics is where uh, you, are the techniques that you use to go from a sample of individuals and make generalizations about the population. So if you were doing this study and you found that people who participated in sports had lower amounts of depression, without inferential statistics, all that you could say is that for the 100 people that you surveyed in your study, for those people and only those people Participation in sports, lower depression. That's what you can say, and that's where it ends. So all of the hundreds of thousands or millions of people in this, you know, in the country who are suffering from depression, if they asked you, do you think they would benefit from participating in sports? Based on those 100 uh, subjects that you ran, without inferential statistics, all you can say is, I don't know, maybe. I know what I found works for these 100, but I can't really say anything about anybody else. And that's where psychology would end. And imagine how useless psychology would be if that's all that we could do. The power of psychology comes from inferential statistics. The power of psychology comes from the fact that we can take a look at 100 scores and then make generalizations, intelligent generalizations, non-biased, objective generalizations about the entire population. So instead of just saying, depression, uh, sorry, uh, uh, participation in sports lowers depression for these 100 people, we can say participation in sports lowers depression in general so that people outside of our study can benefit from uh, our psychological contribution. So that's what we're going to be doing. That's the ninja stuff that we're going to be working towards, that inferential statistics, but it's built upon this foundation of descriptive statistics. All right, so one of the first descriptive statistic techniques we're going to use is the idea of the frequency distribution. And what a frequency distribution is, we have a picture of one right here. It is a ordering of your, uh, of your data in a specific way. It's an ordered listing of how many individuals achieve a particular score. So in a variable that you're measuring, how many individuals achieved each score in, on that particular variable. You put it in order, that's a frequency distribution. So for example, we'll zoom in here. If I gave a test to a group of students and the test was out of 100, this would be a picture of a frequency distribution for that particular test. So in this case, we have all of the possible scores here on the x-axis, and each of these bars represents how many people achieved that particular score. So the first thing that we'll notice is that nobody scored zero to nine. Nobody scored 10 to 19. Nobody scored 20 to 29. Nobody scored 30 to 39. Nobody scored 40 to 49. But then once we get to 50 to 59 out of 100, we find out that some people scored that amount. And specifically, we have one, two individuals that achieved that score. So it's the frequency of individuals that achieved a particular score. And the way I like to think about it is this is almost like an apartment building where people live and their score is the address that they live at. So two people here live at a score of 50 to 59. We got four people who live in the apartment building, whoops, five people, who live in the apartment building next to them with a score of 60 to 69. We got four people living at 70 to 79. We got another five people living 80 to 89. And then we got that one solitary individual living at 90 to 100. And that is a frequency distribution of the scores on this particular test. So again, this frequency distribution has taken a whole bunch of numbers 
summarize them in a way that we can understand. And then once you are able to read a frequency distribution uh, very fluently, you'll see that it summarizes a lot of information in a very useful way uh, that's very readily understandable and very quickly understandable to our human minds. Any questions so far? All right. So these frequency distributions, uh, they can be made or structured uh, in two major ways. So one way is to have them in a table, and then the other way is to have them in a graph. So the graph we've just seen, and we'll see how to build that in just a little bit, uh, the table we're going to take a look at right now. So frequency tables, let's consider the following example. Let's say that you got the following set of n equals 20 scores. So that n there, that stands for the number of scores. So oftentimes it's important to know just how many scores do you have in your raw scores. And n is what is used to indicate how many scores you have. So if you see n equals 20, that means that you have a set of 20 scores. There's 20 scores in total, and they're on a 10-point uh, scale. So it was a 10-point quiz, and there are the scores right there. When you take a look at that, those scores, even though it's only 20, it's kind of hard to make sense of this particular uh, set of scores. And it's kind of hard to answer questions about this particular set of scores. So for example, if I decided that anybody that scored six or lower on this 10 point quiz is going to have to come into an office hour for some extra, uh, some extra tutoring, uh, how many people can I expect to have in my office hour? What's the attendance that I can, uh, can plan for? Taking a look at that score, that set of scores right there, very difficult to answer that question. So what we need to do is we need to construct a frequency table of these scores. We need to put it in an order, uh, put it in a structure that our human minds can deal with. So this is what the frequency table has as its headings. The first one, it has a capital X. That's, uh, that's apparently standing for the scores. It does not stand for scores. I wrote it that way because that is the typical way that you're going to see it. But you're going to do yourselves a large favor. And whenever you see a frequency table and you see that X, all right, so if you see a frequency table that has the scores, you're going to read that as the possible scores. All right, so don't get in the habit of reading X as the scores when you encounter it in a frequency table. In a frequency table, it's special. It's the possible scores. And I'll show you why that is important in just a moment. So this is oftentimes read as a score. Read it as a possible scores. F over here is for the frequencies. Again, do not read it as F. Read it as the frequency. And uh, what you would do is you would list all of your possible scores. So in this test, it is possible to get 10 out of 10. And in this quiz, it is possible to get 9 out of 10. And it's possible to get 8. And it's possible to get 7. And you can get 6. And you can get a 5. And at one point, these go automatically. You can get a four, a three, oh no, they don't, a two and a one. And you can even get zero. You can get zero out of 10. You can get everything incorrect. So what we do is we list the possible scores, and then we construct a frequency table by ordering uh, these scores and getting the number for each of these possible scores. So for example, we'll zoom in on that just to get the ball rolling. What we would do is we would go through all 20 scores and we would count how many times does the score of 0 out of 10 occur. And if you go through here and you count how many times people got 0 out of 10, you'll find out that it has a frequency of 0. Right? So 0 out of 10 never occurs. It has a frequency of 0. You would do the same for 1 out of 10. You would scan through the 20 scores. 1 out of 10 does not occur. It also has a frequency of 0. So this table has now told us that for a possible score of 0 out of 10, 0 people achieved it. For a possible score of 1 out of 10, 0 people achieved that. For a possible score of 2 out of 10, we will start analyzing our scores, and we have one individual right there scored 2 out of 10. We have a second individual right there scored 2 out of 10. So we have two people 
that scored two out of 10. So two, a possible score of two has a frequency of two. It occurred twice. Same thing we would do with a score of three. There's one individual that scored three out of 10. There's another individual that scored three out of 10. A score of three out of 10 has a frequency of two as well. We will continue on with this for a score of four. So that occurs twice as well. It has a frequency of two. We would continue on with a score of five. Five has a frequency of two. We would continue on with scores of six. There's only one person that scored a six out of 10. It has a frequency of one. We got one, two, three, four people that scored seven out of 10. It's got a frequency of four. And then we got one, two, three individuals that scored eight out of 10. And that's got a frequency of three. We got one individual that scored nine out of 10. So that has a frequency of one. And then we got one, two, three individuals that scored 10 out of 10. So 10 out of 10 has a frequency of three. So as you can see, once we have all these frequencies up here, they're much easier to deal with. So for example, one of the first things that we can do is we can check to make sure that we've done our frequency table correctly by checking how many scores that we have in our frequency table. So if we add up all of these frequencies right here, what number should we end up with for this situation? We should end up with 20, exactly. We were told there were 20 scores. We better have 20 scores in our frequency table. So if we add up all of the frequencies, we get a sum of 20, so we know we've created it correctly. So remember back last class, the summation formula in Excel, if you're uh, making your frequency distributions in Excel, uh, you can use that to double check to make sure that you've created them correctly. All right, other things that you can do with this is you can answer questions by, uh, that, are, that would be much, much more difficult to answer with just a random assortment of numbers like this. So for example, I mentioned before that if I was giving this test, I might decide that people that scored six out of 10 or lower need to attend a tutoring session in order to improve their skills. So in that case, I would wanna plan how many people are gonna to come to this particular tutoring session. Well, looking over here, I'm basically asking how many people scored six out of 10 or lower, and that is not something that my human brain can easily do. Looking at it here, much easier to do. So we got one person that scored a six, one plus two is three, plus two is five, plus two is seven, plus two is nine. There are nine people that scored six or lower. I should expect nine students to come to this extra tutorial session. Uh, if you are going to uh, give out uh, prizes to people that scored nine out of 10 or higher, you know, that you are going to need one prize plus three prizes, four prizes total, because four people score nine out of 10 or higher. So it's much easier to understand your data when it's in this format. It's in a format that our human brains can understand. All right, so uh, one thing though that tricks our human brains, and I'm gonna mention this right now, and this is why I want you to always read this, as the possible scores. So one mistake that I have seen time and time and time and time and time and time again is when you're dealing with a frequency table and you have to interact with it and you have to uh, get certain information from the frequency table, one of the classic, very common things that people ask for is the sum of the scores, right? So we just talked about this last time you could be asked, what is the sum of the scores, right? Very common question. Given this frequency table right here, what are the sum of the scores? And this is where you need to make sure that you have a rock solid understanding of what it is that is being displayed here so that you don't fall for this error. Because I mentioned, read this column right here, not as the scores, but as the possible scores. Because the number one error that people make 
when they're asked for the sum of the scores and they're dealing with a frequency table, is not understanding what that frequency table is giving them and then simply saying, well, I'm looking for the sum of X, right? That's even worse. But I'm looking for the sum of the scores. Where can I find the scores? Well, here's something that says scores. So the sum of the scores is going to be 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus, and that is completely wrong. So the sum of the scores is not just summing down this column here because these are the possible scores. They're not the scores that people actually achieve, right? Nobody got a score of zero. Nobody got a score of one. Those are not the scores. Those are the possible scores. So make sure that you really understand, take the time to really kind of focus in on what a frequency table is actually showing you so that when you see a question like, oh, what are the sum of the scores, you'll take a look at this frequency table and you'll say to yourself, all right, well, I remember that this column here, even though it's labeled X, which is the scores, in a frequency table, this is the possible scores. And we're not asking for the sum of the possible scores. We're asking for the sum of the scores. So what I need to do is I need to read this frequency table and say, all right, we got three scores of 10 out of 10. So we're going to want to go 10 plus 10 plus 10. And then what do we have? We got one score that's 9 out of 10. So then we go plus 9. And then what do we have? We got eight score, sorry, three scores that are 8 out of 10. So we go 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus, and then you do it for 7, 6, 5, all the way down until your last actual score. So this is the sum of the scores. So again, there's going to be pitfalls in statistics. Uh, it's, it's straightforward once you get that understanding, but there's going to be these little possible tricks and little possible pitfalls along the way. I'll highlight as many of those as I can, but the rest is up to you. So when you're encountering a frequency table, again, read this as the possible scores so that when you see a question asking you for the sum of the scores, and this happens all the time in stats, when you're reading off the table, you won't just sum that column right there, which is going to be a temptation. Fight against it. Don't do it. You're going to unpack the table and recover the actual scores so that you can do the sum of these scores. All right, so that is my warning uh, in terms of the sum of the scores. Uh, so we'll continue on. So that was a frequency table using frequencies. Sometimes you'll also see frequency tables using percents. So occasionally, especially once you get into the thousand uh, subject uh, limit, uh, the numbers just get too big, the numbers just get too complicated, that you want to deal with percentages instead of actual raw frequencies. So you can convert this into percentages using this formula over here, where you have the frequency for each score divided by the number of scores multiplied by 100, that'll give you the percent. So if we apply that to this table here, we can see that 3 divided by 20, so we got 3 scores of 10 out of 10. We got 20 total scores multiplied by 100, that gives us a percent of 15. And using that formula, we can populate the rest of these with percentages and you'll know that you've done that correctly if this adds up to 100 or, depending upon rounding error, 99.9 .9 or 100.1. Sometimes you'll, you'll get a little bit off uh, if you round it to, uh, to her. All right, so that's a frequency table. Any questions on that? All right. So the other form that it can be structured as is a graph. So we've already seen the graph. So let's take this frequency table here and we'll put it into a graph form. So the graph uh, is usually called a histogram. And uh, that's a graph that is a frequency distribution graph and it looks like this. So this graph is made out of the table that we just uh, created. So if we were to take this table and then put it into graphical form, that's what the numbers would look like. So there's the table uh, for comparison. And as you can see, we have scores once again on the bottom here. Once again, in a histogram and a frequency distribution, these are possible scores. So once again, if you see the sum of the scores, 
and you're given this histogram, do not go, oh, that's, let me see, there are the scores right there, zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus wrong, that's not the way to do it. Realize that these are the possible scores and you have to unpack these bars here to find out what the real scores are. So once again, we got three people that scored a 10. We go 10 plus 10 plus 10. We got one person that scored a nine plus nine. Uh, three people that scored an eight, eight plus eight plus eight. And then so on, you need to unpack that particular graph. But in this case, once again, in graphical form here, you can see that the height of each bar indicates the frequencies that these scores occurred at. And something like this can give you a very uh, quick uh, look at the data to figure out how, is your, how are your scores, for example, distributed. So in this case, it is clear that a large portion of the students are doing rather well, but it's also clear that a large portion of the students are doing particularly, you know, they're having a particular hard time, they're struggling. So it very quickly lets me know that there are these two distinct groups of students uh, that they're rather sizable, it's, it's a rather large area for this histogram. And again, that's just something that you'll uh, be able to do the more able you are to read uh, a particular histogram. All right, so any questions on the graph, the histogram here? All right, so the last thing that I'll mention is that uh, in, in stats, they, uh, they distinguish between a histogram and what's known as a bar graph. So this is nitpicking. It's not going to come up in this semester, but it does come up from time to time in your readings, and it will come up uh, in your sort of academic career as psychologist. So I just want to make sure that you know the difference. So this right here is a histogram, and a histogram does not have spaces between the bars, and that is used to indicate, to indicate uh, continuous data, data where you can get those in-between scores. A bar graph, on the other hand, has spaces between the bars, and this is to indicate uh, scores that are discrete. So technically, if I had scores on a 10-point quiz, I should put them up as a bar graph, indicating that you can score a two, or you can score a three, but you cannot get two and a half. And you can score a seven, but you can't get seven and a half. Right, so that's what's indicated here in the bar graph. Notice, though, that it gives you the exact same information. So the bars are exactly as high. It's built off of the same frequency distribution table. It's just that it's, uh, and again, it's kind of like a nitpicky thing uh, that you'll encounter in different areas. Question? Um, you said the first one was continuous data. What's the bar graph? Discontinuous data. Yep. Yeah, so continuous data... Uh, one of the one of the easiest ones to um, uh, one of the easy exa examples for continuous data is height, right? People can they just gradually increase in height. So you can be five foot six, you can be five foot six and a quarter, five foot six and a half, five foot six and three quarters. You can be in between there depending upon how finely you want to measure it. So if I was graphing heights and I wanted to make sure that technically nobody was going to argue with the way that I graphed this frequency distribution, I would put heights as a histogram. If I was grading scores on a 10-point quiz, it should technically be in a bar graph, um, but we're not going to make that distinction uh, in this course, but just something that you should know for your future in, in psychology. All right, any final questions on uh, anything that we covered today? All right, so that's the new stuff. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn it over to practice time, but before we do, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, uh, just make sure that you are aware of the MyStatLab uh, study plan. Uh, it's the quiz me points option. Make sure that as you're pro uh, progressing through your study plan, you are earning mastery points. So the score that is going to be substituted for your pretest points is going to be your mastery points. So for example, I believe in chapter one, there are three mastery points up, to gra up for grabs. If you complete, and let's say that, you know, on the pretest you really struggle, uh, let's say that you got 0% on the pretest. If you grab one mastery point out of the three, then I will change your pretest grade to 33%. If you get two mastery points out of the three, 
I will change your pretest points to 66%. If you get all three, I will change your pretest points to 100%. So that's how the study plan mastery points work. Use it to supplement your pretest points. Use it just to gain extra familiarity and practice with the concepts that we're looking at. Uh, it's a great resource. And you can actually earn these mastery points as well through completing your pretest, through completing your homework. So it does track whether or not you're mastering these skills outside of the QuizMe options, but the QuizMe options are the direct way to earn those mastery points. Uh, we got a pretest uh, coming up for chapter two, so we're going to start chapter two in the next class. So make sure that you complete that pretest. It's due uh, by uh, tomorrow by midnight. And then we also, you are now ready to do homework assignment uh, number two, chapter one. And that is going to be due once again tomorrow by uh, midnight. And uh, just one more time, be sure that you are getting familiar with how to use my lab. Specifically, be sure that you know your due dates. So your due dates are in my lab. Your due dates are in the syllabus. They are in multiple areas. Uh, that is to make sure that you have ample opportunities to know when your due dates are. But again, it's your responsibility to stay on top of those so that you can earn the maximum points while you're learning uh, statistics. All right, so that is all that I wanted to cover for today. So we got half an hour left uh, for practice time. So this would be a good time uh, to um, try some of the Excel sheets uh, that we had last time on order of operations. Make sure that you got that down uh, and working. You can uh, start up on your uh, homework assignment uh, for chapter one. Uh, give that a go, uh, test that out. Basically, uh, if you have any issues or anything, feel free to call me over. But, uh, you know, if you had a hard three-day weekend and uh, you kind of all statsed out for the morning, feel free to call an early day. But uh, if you do stick around uh, for practice, uh, call me over and I'll be glad to help. Other than that, I'm done covering what I wanted for the day.